Most of the time, things happen just perfectly here on the floor of Blockbuster Video. Customers get what they want, employees enjoy their work, managers balance the books to the T. If only all days at Blockbuster were this perfect. Well, as we all know, not every day has a happy ending. Although it is rare, accidents do happen, and knowing exactly what to do after an accident occurs is a crucial part of every employee's job. In this video, we will be looking at four topics relating to risk management and how these topics relate to your professional success and your personal safety. We will be taking a closer look at 1. Customer and employee injuries 2. Claims reporting 3. Hazardous materials and 4. Store safety Let's start with customer and employee injuries. Hopefully you will never have to personally experience a customer or employee injury, but sooner or later it will probably happen and it is important to Blockbuster and the injured person that you act quickly and responsibly. Why, you dumbbell. Hey, Larry, where's the forklift? The forklift? It's over there by the baggage loader. Sometimes accidents can be funny to watch. I'm here, baby! Then again, sometimes they are not so funny. They can be expensive and stressful. Pay attention to what follows to avoid turning a simple accident into a major legal liability. The procedures that should be followed in the event of an injury to a customer or an employee are basically the same. The one important thing to remember is that all precautions must be taken to prevent further injury. Help me, someone. I've fallen. If medical attention is needed, have one employee remain with the injured individual. Then call your local emergency medical team. Quick, call 911. This can usually be done by dialing 911. Do not call a private ambulance service. Remain calm and try to prevent the injured person from getting up if the accident resulted from a fall or if there is an injury to the head area. Assure them that professional help is on the way and do what you can to comfort them until help arrives. Clear the area of any onlookers. People standing around staring at the injured person do not accomplish anything and can cause the injured person to become self-conscious or nervous, which could aggravate the injury. If the customer employee is not involved with a back or neck injury or an injury that would render them immobile, it would be a good idea to move them to a secluded area until medical assistance arrives. Do not use the manager's office for this purpose. Have someone at the front door available to guide the emergency medical personnel to the injured person. Then, stand back and help keep the area clear. In the event a customer is injured, assure them that a report will be filled out and forwarded to risk management. Be sure and get the party's name, home phone, and Blockbuster membership number if they are a member. Be sure you have the information necessary and fill out an incident report form if it is a customer injury or the first report of injury form if it is the employee that has been injured. These reports are discussed in the claims reporting section of this video and are in your risk management manual with instructions on filling them out for the state in which you are located. A word of caution. Do not offer the injured customer aspirin or any other forms of medication. This could result in a dangerous situation. If the injury is a small cut or scratch, use of gauze or Band-Aid is okay. Remember, if an injury occurs in the store, one, evaluate the situation, two, call emergency medical services, usually 911, three, have person remain calm, and four, complete report form. 
Never move the injured person against their will. Never offer medications. And never offer information about whose fault the accident may have been or that Blockbuster has any forms of insurance. These issues are always best dealt with by the Risk Management Office. Next on our topic list is the subject of claims reporting. As we just showed you, one of the four important steps to remember during an accident is to record the incident properly on the appropriate incident report. Proper documentation is essential to prevent unnecessary misunderstandings. Properly documented incidents demonstrate to the injured customer that we are professional and intend to resolve the issue professionally and honorably. Sloppy or incomplete documentation often irritates the injured party and can cause major conflicts. Explain to the injured party that all claims must be handled from the risk management department to ensure proper and timely resolution of the issue. The properly completed incident report form is to be distributed as indicated on the form. White copy to the risk management department, canary copy to the district manager, and the pink copy stays in the store files. These reports are confidential information and should be shared only with essential parties with discretion. If the injured customer comes into the store demanding a settlement of their claim, explain that all claims are referred to the risk management department for resolution and store personnel do not have the authority to make a settlement or provide any type of payment on a customer injury claim. Incident report forms should be filled out any time a customer or any other outside party makes a claim for bodily injury or property damage against a Blockbuster store. Likewise, whenever there is any store damage due to theft, robbery, water damage, floods, sprinkler leakage, fire, lightning, windstorm, etc., an incident report form should be completed and distributed as soon as possible after the damage occurs. If there is a life-threatening injury or serious property damage, call the Risk Management Department as soon as possible. Use voicemail if necessary. Whenever an employee becomes injured or claims to be injured as a result of an on-the-job accident, the state first report of injury form must be filled out even if the injury was not witnessed by the manager. Be sure to write your store code number on the upper right-hand corner of the form. Once you have completed and mailed the state form to the correct address, all further contact with doctors, hospitals, or attorneys should be referred to the Risk Management Department for handling. If the employee is going to experience more than one day's lost time, you must notify your Zone Human Resources Department to coordinate the proper handling of the employee's pay. The Risk Management Department should also be notified by phone of any lost time injuries. Once an injured employee returns to work, both the Zone Human Resources and Risk Management Departments should be notified of this event. Whenever a worker's compensation claim is reported to the insurance company, Blockbuster's own Supervisor's Accident Investigation Report form should be completed by the injured employee's immediate supervisor and mailed to the Risk Management Department along with Risk Management's copy of the State First Report of Injury form. Store management should keep a copy of this investigative form for review to help prevent the same accident from happening again. Be sure to follow the accident investigation guidelines A through F listed in your risk management manual. If store personnel have any questions about filing workers' compensation claims, they should be encouraged to call the risk management office. In the event that a lawsuit is presented to store personnel for acceptance, these steps should be taken. Be absolutely sure that the lawsuit sometimes called a summons and complaint, is correctly addressed to either Blockbuster Entertainment Corporation or to Blockbuster Video at your store's street address. If the name and address listed are incorrect, do not accept service of the suit papers. If you accept the summons and complaint, send it immediately to the Risk Management Department by overnight mail, if possible. Remember, this information is confidential and should not be discussed by store personnel unless requested by the home office. There is a federal regulation known as the Hazard Communications Act, which you may or may not have heard of. It is also known as the Right to Know Law and affects all of us. Basically, this regulation says that if you work around any substance that is considered hazardous by definition of the regulation, you have a right to know everything about the product, its makeup, how to use it, 
what health effects could occur if misused, the first aid and medical information. Many products we use today can be considered hazardous due to their chemical makeup. There are three general categories that can cause a product to be listed as hazardous. These are, is it toxic, does it burn, or is it reactive? If the product can make you ill in some way, such as being absorbed through the skin or overexposure to any fumes it might emit, or by ingestion, it is considered toxic and would qualify as hazardous. The second category for a material being hazardous is, is it flammable? Will it readily burn? Gasoline, kerosene, acetone, or various cleaning solvents are flammable and are, therefore, considered hazardous. The third category is reactivity. If I have a container of one product and a container of another product, will they burn, explode, or create an acid if mixed with each other or in some cases mixed with plain water? If so, then the product is considered reactive and is hazardous. We are going to discuss these areas in a little more detail later, but first, let me give you a little background on the law. This regulation was first issued in November 1983 and was directed at chemical manufacturers. It was later amended to include users in the manufacturing sector and then further amended to include all employers. There are three areas that involve Blockbuster as a company and you as an employee. One, we must be sure all products we use are properly labeled. Two, that there is a material safety data sheet on file at the place of employment on each product. And three, that you, the employee, receives training and information about the law and your rights as defined in this law. Let's discuss each of these three areas in a little more detail. Any product containing any material deemed hazardous by this law must be labeled by the manufacturer. If no label is present, then the employer is responsible for placing a label on the container showing the identity of the hazardous substances present and appropriate hazard warnings. The label must be in English. However, another language may be used as necessary as long as English is also on the label. If the product is unlabeled, it should be removed from the store. A good example of a hazard warning is this pack of cigarettes. As you can see, there is a hazard warning on the side of the package telling you what the hazards are. The second item we should concern ourselves with is possibly the most important and informative part of this law. A document called a material safety data sheet is available for every manufactured product. We are required to keep one of these sheets on file in your store on any product containing any material that may be hazardous. These sheets contain a wealth of information, and I will explain how these documents are to be used and interpreted. Some of these sections are more important to you than others, so I will go into more detail later. To explain material safety data sheets to you, I'm going to use the data sheet on liquid paper, or whiteout. This is something that is in every store and is packaged in an innocent-looking little bottle that doesn't look hazardous at all. The first section of a material safety data sheet contains product identification information that gives you the name of the product, the manufacturer, and the actual composition of the product. Here you can see we have several items in liquid paper such as trichloroethylene, 111 trichloroethane, titanium dioxide, resins, dispersants, colorants, and mustard oil. In most cases, the sheet will give the percentage of each component as related to the total product. After the identification section comes the physical data section. This section gives information as to boiling point, specific gravity, and other information as to how the product reacts under certain conditions. Sometimes flammability information is included in this section. Most likely, however, the flammability information is in a separate section. In the case of liquid paper, the material is non-flammable. The next section would be the reactivity section. This section tells you whether the product is stable or if it is unstable, what conditions would have to be present to cause it to react. Liquid paper is stable, but there are some chemicals it should not be mixed with and they are listed. Also, it tells you that if liquid paper should be burning, it could release small amounts of phosgene, hydrogen chloride, and chlorine. The section on health hazard data is the most important. Here we find the occupational exposure limits for the compounds used in liquid paper. As they are in such small amounts in liquid paper, we need not really concern ourselves with this information. 
This section also tells us how liquid paper could hurt us and how to recognize the symptoms should they occur. Next comes a section on environmental impact. This section will tell what can happen if a product will have any effect on the environment. In the case of liquid paper, there are no harmful environmental effects. The next section tells us what methods to use to control exposure. Do we need special engineering controls, eye protection devices, skin protection, or any respiratory protection? In the case of liquid paper, it is non-hazardous when used as directed in an office or room with normal air circulation or ventilation. The section on emergency procedures is mainly for people like the fire department or similar emergency organizations. Here we find data on fire and explosion hazards, how to extinguish a fire and firefighting procedures to be used. Finally, there is a section on first aid and emergency medical procedures. This section tells you what to do if you are overexposed by getting liquid paper in your eyes, too much on your skin, if you are overcome by the vapors, or if you ingest or eat it. Any special notes to the physician are listed in this section. As you can see, liquid paper is relatively safe even though it has some exotic chemicals in its makeup. The only way it can really harm you is if you abuse it by concentrating the vapors and breathing them. The mustard oil mentioned earlier is put in liquid paper to deter abuse in this manner. Now, we use liquid paper in this example because it is common to all our stores and offices. Everyone has seen fire extinguishers, but few people have actually used one on a fire, and that's fortunate. Hopefully, you'll never have to actually use one on a real fire. However, we would like to take the time now to demonstrate the proper use of an extinguisher. Hopefully, the need to use a fire extinguisher will never arise. But in the event that the need does arise, you must know how to properly use the extinguishers. Knowing how to use one will prevent property damage and could save lives, even your own. When a fire is discovered, two things must happen immediately. Inform the manager on duty who will call the fire department. At the same time, see to it that all customers are quickly led out of the store. Do this in a calm manner and use both the front and rear exit doors. This is why it is absolutely crucial that any back doors or side doors remain unbolted or unbarred. These exits are necessary escape routes and must be usable simply by pushing on the push bars. Go to the nearest extinguisher, remove it from its mount and proceed to the fire. Pull the safety pin out and aim the hose at the base of the fire, not at the flames. Discharge the extinguisher by squeezing the grips together and work the discharge stream from the base of the fire upward. Most extinguishers of this size only last a total of 20 seconds or so. After the fire is out, proceed with cleanup before allowing customers back into the store. Call your extinguisher service company and have them come pick up the discharged extinguishers. In all likelihood, they will loan you replacement extinguishers while yours are being serviced. Remember to fill out an incident report and send it to the risk management office. If the fire results in $5,000 or more in damage, call the risk management office immediately. Follow the instructions outlined in the Risk Management Manual. The single biggest cause of extensive fires is slow response in calling the fire department. People seem to think they can handle the fire themselves. Making that decision, whether to call the fire department or try to put the fire out yourself, may be the biggest decision you'll ever make. We urge you, call the fire department right away. Don't be a hero. In order to be sure the fire extinguisher is ready for use, as you have just seen, you must inspect it monthly to be sure it is operational and ready to use. Government regulations require that all fire extinguishers be inspected visually on a monthly basis. The following items need to be checked. Look at the gauge and make sure it indicates in the charged range, not undercharged or overcharged. 
tap on the gauge with your finger to make sure the indicator needle is not stuck. Make sure the safety pin is in place and the seal is unbroken. Remove the hose and look through it, making sure there are no obstructions. The hose will screw off and back on. Also, make sure nothing is blocking your access to the extinguisher. Initial and date the inspector's tag and remount the extinguisher. If any discrepancies are noticed, notify the store manager for corrective action. After completing the inspection, enter the information in the inspection log and sign it. Remember also that all extinguishers must be serviced once per year. Let's make a summary of the key actions to remember in case of any fire. Number one, call the fire department. Two, evacuate the store quickly and calmly. Three, extinguish the fire as best you can. And four, inform the fire department upon their arrival of the situation. Your personal safety and the safety of Blockbuster's valued customers are vital to us. Don't take any chances. An excellent example of a store safety checklist can be found in the Risk Management Manual. This checklist is designed to be completed on a daily basis. Safety is the business of being ready. Is your store ready? Now that we have explained these safety topics to you, you will be asked to sign a training log certifying that you have viewed this video. We hope you never have an accident while working for Blockbuster. This program and other safety programs are designed to provide a safe work environment for you. Your help in seeing that these safety programs are followed can be a large contribution towards your overall future and that of Blockbuster Entertainment. Please direct any questions to your immediate supervisor.